There's a civil war brewing in certain Protestant circles right now. The charismatics, the cessationist, they've had a face-to-face -face debate. Okay, let me, let me, let me stop, stop joking around. Stop with the sound effect. All right. Okay, okay. okay. Um, American Gospel, Dr. Brown, cessationist versus continuous conversation is finally happening, and it's veered into a very interesting direction that I, I don't know how to feel about as a uh, Protestant charismatic. Okay, so Dr. Michael Brown says, American gospel downplays Luther's anti-Semitism. We're going to get there, okay? Martin Luther is the great reformer. We're going to get there. Let me just give you guys the backdrop. Go watch this conversation. Whether you're a cessationist, whether you're charismatic, it doesn't matter. I'll try to summarize as best as I can. It's a four-hour conversation on the American Gospel YouTube channel. Shout out to Brandon. And he facilitated a conversation between Sam Storms, Dr. Brown versus Jim Osmond, Justin Peters. Very good conversation. I recommend all you guys to watch it. If you're a cessationist, if you're a charismatic, it will be good for you to know the questionable sides in both conversations. One side of the conversation is they all believe in miracles, by the way. So this isn't a conversation whether God can move or God can heal and God can do miracles. The question is about gifts of healing and other gifts. And so this is kind of where the conversation goes. The conversation goes to a place where um, the cessationist view is they don't believe that many of the gifts of the Spirit are around today. Those gifts have ceased, meaning that around the end of the, I guess, the first century, those gifts faded out. And as we got the Bible, we don't need gifts of prophecy, so on and so forth. The charismatics or the continuation is believed that those gifts still exist. That's I'm giving you a very, very, very generalized conversation. Please go watch the full conversation. I can't get into all the theology of it. But they get to a, a, a place of, of, of rightfully so pointing out each other's weaknesses. And the conclusion they come to in this conversation is that, listen, you know, the charismatics, we can be a bit too gullible. We can be a bit too gullible and believe uh, folks who are perhaps not truly getting words of prophecy, and we can be, we can be too gullible at times. The issue with the stationist position is they can be too critical, hypercritical, and questionable of everything. And there are times where Dr. Brown will lay out a miracle that happened, and then Justin Peters would sit there and just be like, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. And then it came to a place where Justin Peters, Jim Osmond, rightfully so, start addressing specific teachers, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, um, so on and so forth. And they, they kind of back them into a corner, and they basically say, like, man, here are the things they've said. Here's the false teaching they have. Can you say that this is false teaching, yada, yada, yada? And Dr. Brown and Sam Storms agree that if there's if what you're saying is accurate, yes, this is false teaching. I don't know if I can go to extra mile of condemning them as heretics, okay? Meaning they're not saved. They're going to hell. Yeah. We don't know if we can condemn a Benny Hinn and or a Kenneth Copeland as heretics, they're going to hell, they're, they're intentionally uh, or unintentionally false teachers. They don't know if they can go that far, but they're saying as long, if what you're saying is true, fair enough, this is, this is bad. So then Dr. Brown does something really interesting. He takes that same logic and backs them into a corner. And to their credit, they also concede the point. Now, what happens next is this entire conversation derails into anti-Semitism. And how we get there is, is very interesting. So let's uh, play the beginning of this clip. This is Friends, Dr. This Brown. Friends, this is a very important video. In the strongest possible terms, I need to expose what American gospel has done. This is a great example of what Jesus rebukes when he spoke to the religious leaders and said, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This is Michael Brown, and I want to give you a little context for this video. I participated with Sam Storms in a roundtable discussion with Justin Peters and Jim Osmond talking about false teachers, false teaching, very candid, open discussion over four hours that was released by American Gospel with our approval and blessing, all four of us. And one of the things that I pressed in the video was what I felt were very clear double standards. God hates unequal weights and measures. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, you'll attack a charismatic leader for saying one thing and, and having one practice and write that person off as a false teacher, false prophet, but you'll excuse all kinds of things among people that you love and admire or respect, etc. So in pressing that, there was uh, an interesting dialogue that took place. I, I pressed them earlier in the broadcast, and they pressed us. It was back and forth. It was fair, open, honest in that way. They pressed us about different people. We responded. I pressed them going through some of the horrific anti-Semitic writings of Martin Luther, and they would not write him off. They would not say he shouldn't be in ministry, false teacher, etc. Well, then later in the broadcast, uh, later in the discussion, I came back to it. So I want to play this first clip. This is me reading further quotes from Martin Luther. Here's what we said. Please just hear these quotes you didn't know who's saying them uh, almost every night when i wake up the devil is there and wants to dispute with me i have come to this conclusion 
when the argument that the Christian is without the law and above the law doesn't help, I instantly chase the devil away with a fart. Let's continue. With a fart? <laughs> Every Christian is by faith so exalted above all things that by virtue of a spiritual power, he is Lord of all things without exception so that nothing can do him any harm. As a matter of fact, all things are made subject to him and are compelled to serve him in obtaining salvation. That's a crazy quote. The Christian is above all things and all things are subject to him. He's a Lord above all things. That's kind of wild. That's kind of wild. That's a, that's a Martin Luther quote, according to Dr. Brown. Go ahead. Like the mules who will not move unless you perpetually whip them with rods, so the civil powers must drive the common people, whip, choke, hang, bird, burn, behead, and torture them, that they may learn to fear the powers that be. A peasant is a hog, for when a hog is slaughtered, it is dead. In the same way, the peasant does not think about the next life, for otherwise he would behave very differently. On the obstinate, hardened, blinded peasants, let no one have mercy, but let everyone, as he is able, you, stab, slay, lay about him as though among mud dogs, so that peace and safety may be maintained. And in response to the death of over 100,000 peasants that he was alleged to have incited, it was I, Martin Luther, who slew all the peasants in the insurrection, for I commanded them to be slaughtered. All their blood is upon my shoulders, but I cast it upon the Lord our God, who commanded me to speak in this way. Darkness. I, I will say this. It's not looking good for our poor Luther. As a debate tactic, this is genius. <laughs> Dr. Brown knew that they were going to come with quote after quote after quote from Benny Hinn to Kenneth Copeland, right? And he knew that, yeah, their state say some wild stuff. You know who else says some wild stuff? Your boy. Our boy Martin Luther. All of our boys. <laughs> <laughs> All of our boys, Martin. There would be no Protestant stream of Christianity if it wasn't Martin Luther. So from a debate tactic, this man was playing 4D chess. <laughs> He knew, he knew what was going to happen. That's and he amazing. came with a clip. He came with a cartridge of quote after quote after quote of Luther saying the wildest things. Brilliant from a debate tactic. Now, I will say this. We should have just skills. And one of the things we don't do well, and this is where me and Dr. Brown would differ, and I, and I love Dr. Brown and I respect him and I see him as an elder. One of the areas we differ, and I think a lot of charismatics differ, is I do think we need to be have just skills towards our own. And he has written books about this. He's written multiple, tons of books about uh, the issues within the charismatic circles. So I do think we, we can do a better job, though. I think we can call out the Kenneth Copelands. I think we can call out the Benny Hens. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bill Johnson and Bethel are very problematic. And I think that you do see the Mike Wingers, who is a charismatic Calvary Chapel pastor, guys like myself, you do see us, who are continuationists, addressing this. But in, for whatever reason, you know, Dr. Brown and Sam Storms, maybe they're older, maybe they have more wisdom than us. They do not want to go as far as to call out those people. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I do think you see you see that happening, and I do think that that's good. And I think both things can be true. Both things can be true. But what we shouldn't do, and I guess this is Dr. Brown's point, is you can't condemn these people as false teachers. And Luther, according to what Dr. Brown is saying, allegedly has the blood of sir, peasants on his hands. Yes, Kenneth Copeland said some bad stuff, and I think he's either senile, mentally ill, or demon-possessed. I'm not sure which one he is. That's I don't great. know. But but I think both things can be true at the same time. And I do think we can do a better job of calling that out uh, within our own circles. And again, Dr. Brown has done a lot of this. Uh, he's, he's, he's written books. He's put together a prophetic statement after the 22... A 2020 election deception nonsense. He's done a good job of this stuff. Okay. This now is how Jim Osmond and Justin Peters responded to that. So at least using the same criteria that you've used for Copeland's quotes, for Sid not being in ministry, would you agree that Martin Luther, and again, just a tiny selection, these are all his quotes, should not have been in ministry and should be branded a false teacher? I would say given those quotes, if, if we were in a situation where Luther was alive today and he were writing and saying these things, I would agree with you and say he should not be in ministry. He should shut it down and go sit under somebody who's a sound teacher and and, and stop with this nonsense. Okay. I would Check. want that silent. Checkmate. That's the point. Now, of course, God used Luther. Yeah. Of course, God used Luther. Dr. Brown's making this tongue-in-cheek point. Well, if God can use someone that's anti-Semitic, saying crazy things, talking about peasants, potentially blood on his hands, mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't be as critical about some of these other guys that I think are are, are nuts. Yeah. Um, so, so it's an interesting conversation. Go ahead and play it. And Justin Peters agrees. Credit to, credit to these brothers for being consistent in saying, yes, if he said this stuff and if he was in ministry today, we would sit Luther down. I would agree. Fair enough. Well, uh, to my real dismay, after this video was put out on the American Gospel YouTube channel, there was a response from Chris Roseborough uh, about the sins of Martin Luther. 
now I don't, I don't know Chris personally, but every so often I'll be sent clips from him and people want me to respond and I don't, but I found his attacks often to be unethical, <laughs> and, I found to be <laughs> and I felt it very commonly to be uh, unequal weights and measures where he will give a pass to someone that he agrees with and completely write off someone that he disagrees with. And when any of us do that in any direction, in any ministry we're doing, it's, it's ugly, it's wrong in God's side. Proverbs 7, 15, 17, 15 says that to, to acquit the guilty or to condemn the innocent, both are detestable in God's sight. Again, the sin of straining on a gnat and swallowing a camel. Footage has been released and will be released from American Gospel, not part of American Gospel 3, but separate from that, a four-hour dialogue about false teachers, false prophecy, how do we discern, how do we call these things out, has been released. You can watch that in the American Gospel channel. American Gospel will soon be releasing three, four hours of conversation I had with Doug Gavette and Holly Pevick about so-called NAR, what is real, what is not real in terms of New Apostolic Reformation. And then uh, ultimately, uh, Brandon has my permission to release over four hours of Q&A where I was just asked questions on all kinds of controversial subjects and answered them as honestly as I could. So that means they'll have probably over 12 hours of my material that's been released and we'll get these things out because my goal was to have discussion. My goal was when I was invited to speak to those with different perspectives, to share them. And if I didn't like the way the project was going, I could pull out. That's what ultimately happened. But I said, hey, go ahead and use the, the footage. I don't want to be part of that American Gospel 3 project because I don't like the way it, its the direction is taken. However, use the material, get it out. So there it is. It'll be out for everyone to see. And you can evaluate accordingly and judge the spirit of the conversations as well. What happened more recently is in response to one section on in the roundtable where I challenged Jim and Justin about quotes of Martin Luther and said, just use equal weights and measures. The way you're applying things to Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or Todd White or Sid Roth or others, apply them to Martin Luther. And Jim Osmond then said, well, based on that criteria, if Luther was alive today, he shouldn't be in ministry, he should be sitting under someone and growing in the truth. Then Chris Roseborough, as a Lutheran, put out a response video, which I took very strong issue with. Chris called the show on Friday. We talked largely on the air immediately after we had a short conversation. Then last night, talked for almost two hours. And so, they, both so it sounds like the him and Chris squashed it. They had a great conversation, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Conversation was constructive and fruitful. Quite candid with one another. We pulled the punches in that regard. But I said, I'm going to tell people I believe it was constructive and fruitful. And Chris agreed to that. I don't know that we changed our views on anything. We definitely understand each other's positions better and where we each feel that, that one is helping the church or hurting the church, etc. But I, I want to I take a moment and go through a, a few things with you for context, all right? Uh, over the years, God has burdened me to address many abuses within my own camp, Pentecostal Charismatic Camp. So my first uh, book, 1985, Compassion for Other Consuming Fire, Who's the God of the Old Testament, that was addressing some erroneous teaching within the Word of Faith Camp. My next book, 1989, End of the American Gospel Enterprise, that was mainly a call to repentance and revival within the Charismatic Church of America. How saved are we? Largely dealt with that. I have a whole chapter on cardinal prosperity message being wrong. Then 1991, the whole book, Whatever happened to the power of God as the charismatic church lend the spirit or down for the count. And then it's time to rock the boat in 1993. These were either entirely or largely addressing issues within my own camp, charismatic Pentecostal. 2018, I put out an entire book, Playing with Holy Fire, a wake-up call to the Pentecostal charismatic church. 2014, Hyper Grace, with names, specific details, because it was more academically oriented. And that was largely dealing with abuses within my own camp. So I, I would just ask respectfully, I would ask respectfully, the folks who are cessationist critics and say, why don't you call out this one, this one, this one. May I ask, if you're leaders, how many books you've written critiquing your own camp? How much time you've spent Oops. pointing out what's wrong in your own camp? It's going to be a different set of issues and problems maybe than in charismatic camp, although there's still sexual immorality, there's financial impropriety. There, there are all kinds of other issues. There could be lack of love for the lost, lack of love for the church, bearing false witness, cruelty, pride, all kinds of other things. God, God knows, all right? How much time have you spent doing that? So before you say to me, why don't you call out this one, this one, this one, I, I've actually got a mountain, or a stack, not a mountain, a stack of books where I've called out issues within my own camp. In addition, we put out the prophetic standard statement a few years back saying hmm. there must be more accountability within the body. I have called out by name those who prophesied falsely about Trump on the air and in writing. My most viral article ever, maybe half a million shares, was an open letter to Joel and Victoria Osteen. So when I feel it's appropriate, when I'm burdened, I'll address these things, all right? And then when uh, Justin Peters has said to me, what about this, what about this? I read a letter from Justin Peters on the air saying, if Kenneth Copeland actually teaches all these things, and this is in context what you're saying, accurate, then of course it's heresy. Easy to say. The roundtable discussion gave me a list of things regarding Betty Hinn. If all those things are accurate and true, then of course that's heresy. Sure. Easy. Easy. You say, why aren't you calling them out? Okay, hang on. God did not appoint me to call out everyone you want me to call out. There are people urging me to call out John MacArthur over certain issues. Urging me. Oops. Urging me. Oops. With detailed documentation, what he should be called out on. There are people who want me to call out Justin Peters and are calling him a wolf. I have to do what God has called me to do, and when I'm burdened about a particular subject, I'll focus on it, I'll deal with it, I'll address it. That's what we all have to do 
as servants mm. of the Lord. What I find ironic, as I get blasted for defending Todd Bentley, I, I have been probably Todd's worst critic for maybe 20 years. And in 2009, stated publicly at our church and then other settings I had, that by committing adultery, leaving his wife, and then marrying the woman he committed adultery with, he was in sin and should not be in ministry. And true repentance would mean going back to his, his original wife. And, and then oversaw a panel that said he should never lead a ministry again. So somehow I get called a defender, and, these, and, and they pop up all the time. I see it every single day. I don't, I don't look at social media comments normally, but if there's a controversy swirling, I may just want to look at some things and see what's going on. It's, I find it quite extraordinary. And the same with Mike Bickle, as allegations came out against him, never defended him. He said, boy, it's shocking. I couldn't believe it. I spoke very highly of him, as did Sam Storms, uh, 11 months ago in the roundtable discussion. We, we were wrong in, in terms of our assessment of him, but that's, what, that's who we knew him to be. So mm. these other charges, the moment they came out, I said, all the truth has to come to light. Let there be a right process where we find it out, but it all has to come to light. And, and these are serious allegations that need to be looked into. I find them shocking, but they're serious. And then as more and more uh, t uh, testimonies came and it was a delay after delay about seeing formal investigations, uh, I was part of a team that put out a statement saying that based on this history through credible witnesses, he's disqualified from public ministry for life. I've done those things, but if I don't call out this one the way you ask me to, or denounce this one, or say that this one's not saved, I'm not doing enough. I, I find that unrighteous, inconsistent, and unhelpful. What I have been seeking to, to do is very simple. Let there be equal weights and measures. I just think Dr. Michael Brown is playing 4D chess in this entire conversation. I think he's just overall a better debater. And I think we can do a better job mm -hmm. in certain charismatic circles of calling out some of the foolishness. However, to his point, do they call out some of their own foolishness? Mm. So anyway, I, I think this good that this conversation is happening. I think that what, what tends to happen, again, is in charismatic circles, we don't go far enough mm. to, to mark and avoid. And I think they go too far to mark and avoid everybody. So do you claim the charismatic circle? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I have no problem with saying I'm charismatic and you I'm say continuation. You're charismatic with a seatbelt. Charismatic with a seatbelt, yeah. And, mm. and and the only reason I say seatbelt is because I think the the Benny Hens, the Kenneth Copelands are dangerous. But the seatbelt's kind of coming off a little bit. No. <laughs> Why well, how could you say it's coming off if I'm if I'm literally saying I disagree with Dr. Brown because I don't think we go far enough in condemning some of these guys? Because uh, okay. because what will happen is then we will be gullible. Yeah. And their whole bit in in that four hour conversation, this part aged like milk is they were really like Mike Bickle, he's a great man of God, da, 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 da. and then like that part ends and then a thing comes up and it's a statement from them saying like, we were blindsided by the Mike Bickle scandals, this was shot before we knew. So it's like sometimes charismatics will be too gullible, mm. right, and a bit naive, Yeah. And but the cessationists will be too harsh and too critical and, and too quick to mark and avoid. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that balance is, but I, I outside of this entire conversation, which I think is a healthy conversation, I've been having conversations of, yes, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, these statements, they're bad, they're problematic. I think the issue is if you don't say they're not saved, if you don't say they're condemned to hell, it seems like it's never good enough for the folks on the cessationist side. Mm. And I genuinely don't speak about anyone's salvation like that because i just i just don't know i think somebody could be teaching false teaching and potentially still be saved yeah you know what i mean like i think that's possible um and i think somebody could be misbehaving and still be saved mm -hmm. you know and so i think the lack of just scales is a fair critique on dr brown's part mm -hmm. i think that's gotcha. a very fair and reasonable thing to say hey look i have a mountain of of books calling out my own when have you guys called out your own yeah you know because there's more than enough stuff to call out on the um, cessation aside, but defending Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland, just not a good look. It's not a good hill to die on. It's, it's not a good look. It's not a good, um, not a good hill to die on. There's a lot of hope in Jesus's words found in John 5, 24. He tells us, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And that is the latest theme of our newest collection that's coming out next week. So be on the lookout for the Death to Life collection available only Monday through Sunday next week. Go to blessgod.shop, sign up on the email list so you don't miss the drop. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.